the mere mention of the name Caiaphas triggers an avalanche of associations, all of them negative. Religion is privilege. Religion is exploitation. Religion is a rich man's club, an in-group of wealthy insiders. Religion as commodity. Religion as oppression. Herod entered the story of Jesus at the very beginning, at Jesus' birth. Herod tried to kill him, and he didn't succeed. He massacred many, many babies, but Jesus escaped the massacre. Caiaphas entered the story of Jesus near the end, with Jesus on trial for his life. Caiaphas was part of a conspiratorial plot to kill Jesus, and the plot succeeded. Jesus was killed. The two men, Herod and Caiaphas, operated in quite different worlds. Herod was a politician working out of a world of Roman power and paganism. Caiaphas was a priest working out of a Jewish world of worship and belief in God. Herod was a leader in the secular world. Caiaphas was a leader in the religious world. They were both very, very good at what they did. They were both against Jesus. They both saw their worlds of influence threatened by Jesus. Killing Jesus was a fixed policy with both of them. They were both powerful at the top of their respective realms if archaeologists ever turn up a document that contains their vision statements, something that I'm told all good leaders formulate, it's a good bet that they would be identical. Kill Jesus. We don't know much about Caiaphas. Virtually nothing compared to the extensive lore that surrounds Herod. We know nothing about him personally except that he held a position of prominence in a Jerusalem family of high priests, and that he was associated with the party of the Sadducees, the rival party of the Pharisees. We know that this Jerusalem priestly family had its power base in the temple. We know that Caiaphas' father-in-law, Annas, had been high priest ten years before, and that he had successfully kept the position in the family. These high priests, this family of Annas and Caiaphas and a few others, were affluent, aristocratic, interested in making it big and associating with the important people in government and culture, in contrast to the rival party of the Pharisees who were made, that was made up of the common people, and more interested in being the best Jews they could be in a world flooded with anti-Jewish values and strategies. By virtue of his family, his position, and the Sadducean world that he inhabited, we know that Caiaphas was aristocratic, privileged, a religious professional who made a more than comfortable living from his profession. A recent excavation in Jerusalem has put an extravagantly opulent residence on display that some scholars think is almost certainly the home of Caiaphas, and probably Annas as well. Some of you have no doubt been there and have been impressed by the lavish style of life in which the high priest indulged himself. Caiaphas was a priest at the top of his profession, a high priest, and he occupied this position at a time in history when the Jerusalem high priests were slotted into the highest social echelon of that society. Caiaphas was the most prominent and powerful religious leader during those years that Jesus was making his way around the country, telling people, follow me. A priest is a key leader in most societies in the world or at least used to be, and here's the reason. The core of our being as men and women is image of God. 
We are created by God for God. Our relationship with God is the most important thing about us. We have physical needs of food and clothing and housing and healing. We have social needs of family and friends and neighbors. We have security needs for protection. We have emotional needs for love and recognition and comfort. We have intellectual needs to know and understand. We're complex, multifaceted creatures. The variations among us are staggering. No one of us is quite like another. We serve one another by helping one another meet these needs. Farmers and teachers and physicians and soldiers and lawyers and writers and merchants and artists and builders and bankers. We can make a long, long list. But at the center of all these needs and permeating them is our need for God. Priests are persons who take leadership in helping us deal with this God need. And we do need help. We don't live very long before we find that we would rather be our own gods. We like to have God in the background, a kind of safety net for the times when we fall off our self-made God tightrope. But when things are going well and the sun is shining and all our other needs are being met, we are not really keen on dealing with God. But as a matter of fact, things don't always go well. The sun doesn't always shine every day. And our other needs don't always get met to our satisfaction. And in the midst of all these dissatisfactions and frustrations, our fundamental neediness, we find ourselves looking for help at the center, our core being, our need for God. More than in all other needs, we realize we don't know what we're doing. We need help. We need a priest. A priest stands in the middle between God and the human. The priest presents God to us, tells us who God is, the way he acts, the truth that he reveals and invites. He opens his arms to receive us to this God, to believe in him, to, to trust and worship him. And the priest presents God to us, presents our sin, and the priest presents us to God, presents our sin and guilt, our work, our thanksgivings, our failures, pretensions, sicknesses, ignorance, and asks God to receive us, forgive us, guide us, heal us, save us. The priest offers God to us, all of God, everything that God does, a gift to us. The priest offers us to God, everything that we are, and we do a gift to God. There's no coercion either way. The priest clears a vast field for freedom in which God freely gives and we receive, in which we freely give and God receives. Just as God is most himself in this meeting, we are most ourselves. The action over which the priest presides, this back and forthness, this giving and receiving, receiving, giving, is worship. And the heart of the action is the exchange that takes place in sacrifice. Here's how it works. A place of worship is prepared. The place is set aside as a meeting place between God and us. Something is constructed to give witness to the presence of the invisible God, a stone, a tent, a temple. An altar is set up to focus attention on the exchange that takes place. At this altar, men and women bring an offering. It's to be the very best that we have. It can be a goat or a lamb or a dove or a cup of flour or a crust of bread or a loony. How much or how little, it doesn't matter, but it does have to be the best that we have to offer. As we bring our offering, we are saying, this is the best I have. This is the best I can do, but it isn't good enough. It doesn't satisfy my need to be whole and saved. It hasn't worked. Here it is, God, your turn. See what you can make of it. 
There's a vivid scene etched in two lines in Psalm 5 in which this action is going on. It's a snapshot of the action. The psalm as a whole is a morning prayer that pivots on an act of sacrifice. Here are the two lines. O Lord, in the morning thou dost hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice and watch. I'm going to watch and see what God's going to do with this. The psalmist has placed his offering on the altar. The sacrificial animal or loaf of bread or a cup of barley meal is there. And then the priest starts a fire under it. The psalmist watches. I prepare a sacrifice and watch. What does he see? He watches the offering burn up. That's what he sees. The smoke ascending to God and becoming invisible as it is transformed into forgiveness and grace and blessing and healing, eternal life. When the sacrifice is, is finally consumed, the transaction is complete, the priest pronounces absolution, benediction, forgiveness, salvation. Page after page after page in our Bibles is given over to training our imaginations and enlisting our participation in just this kind of a meeting. All that altar building in Genesis, the elaborate instructions for constructing the tabernacle and the priests' robes in Exodus, the meticulous working out of various sacrifices for various needs in Leviticus, the exactness and detail provided in Kings, Chronicles for building the Solomonic Temple, the care given in Chronicles to provide adequate personnel and sufficient preparation for worship services, the precise refocusing of sacrificial worship on Jesus himself in the four Gospels, and then that stunning recasting and re-understanding in Hebrews of Jesus as the ultimate priest. And then that glorious finale in the Revelation in which this entire world of sacrificial worship is brought together and reproduced in heaven. That's what priests do. This is what Caiaphas did. When Jesus said, follow me, this is the world into which he is going. Interestingly and somewhat surprisingly, given what I've just said, this glorious context in which this work takes place and the eternal and holy significance of each detail, priests don't emerge from the pages of scripture with a very good reputation. Melchizedek is the first priest presented in the biblical story, but we know virtually nothing about him, a shadowy figure in the Abraham story. Aaron is the first priest we see in action and he bungles the work terribly, making that infamous golden calf and leading the people in a kind of worship that separated them from God instead of bringing them to him. Old Eli comes off as a fat old man with about as much sense of God and care for people as a rhinoceros, and his two priest sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were drunks with the sexual morals of tomcats. When Jeremiah was trying to trying his best to speak God's word to his people. It was a Jerusalem high priest, Pashur, son of Imur, who made his life miserable, beating him up and putting him in jail. There were also good priests, Samuel and Ahimelech and Abiathar and Zadok, and the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, who teamed up with Zerubbabel to rebuild Israel after the exile. But when Caiaphas appears on the scene at the trial of Jesus, the priesthood for 200 years has been getting worse and worse and worse. And it was about as worse, that's not the right way to say that, but it's about as worse as it can get when it comes to Caiaphas. After the return from exile, the Jews were under the political rule, first of the Persians, then the Greeks, and finally the Romans. In the absence of their own political leader, the religious leader, the high priest, was the most prominent and powerful person in the Jewish community. 
And this is as it should be for the Jews, for they were defined as God's people. Their identity was totally wrapped up in God and his covenant and commandments and worship. The Jerusalem temple presided over by the high priest was the nerve center for Jews, even though Persian and Greek and Roman kings and governors ran the country. 